Hello, and welcome to the Still To Be Determined podcast, the podcast that follows up on topics from the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell. I am not Matt Farrell. I am Sean Farrell. I'm a writer, and I'm the older brother of Matt Farrell, who is hiding in a tree right now. Hi, I'm Matt Farrell, hiding in a tree. Today, we're going to be talking about his most recent episode, which was Top 10 Home Automation Ideas, Ultimate Smart Home Tour. This is from June 16th, 2020. The first thing I noticed is you started outside, you worked outside, inside, and it made yes. me wonder, what are you trying to hide? <laughs> <laughs> Shh, you're not supposed to say anything, Sean. <laughs> and then as the video progressed, I realized, oh, you're trying to hide what your garage looks like. <laughs> it was actually Sue's idea to frame the video that way because I was having trouble understanding, like, how do I present this information in somewhat of a, quote, logical way? And she said, well, work from outside to inside. So. Right. You could have also done it, and this occurred to me um, as the video was going on, you could have done it by price. Yeah, that's another way I could have done it. Which, if you did it by price, what is the least expensive of all the suggestions you made? Oh, man. Put me on the spot. Uh, the cheapest stuff that I've I've gotten that video is probably like 20 bucks. Some of those are contact sensors and doors. And what's the most expensive? The door locks are, you know, 250 Okay. I was also thinking the Roomba automation, the Roomba itself. The Roombas, ex rooms are very expensive. Yeah, yes. they're expensive. Another way of breaking down the video would have been ease of installation. And what oh, yeah. would the order of that be? Easiest to hardest. Easiest would be like that Ecobee camera. I mean, like that, that you know, plug it in and you open up the app and you couple taps, it's up and running and Bob's your uncle, you're done. The hardest stuff is some of the automations around like when my door locks with the contact sensors and running the rule machine rules to do the auto locking after five minutes. It's like in my system, that might be a little, it's not hard, but if you don't know what you're doing, you're probably going to spend some time figuring it out. Mm -hmm. So it's in some cases, the difficulty is if this, then that logic puzzles. Yeah. The, the, the hardest part oftentimes is thinking like a computer programmer. Because you have mm -hmm. to think in that terms of if if this and this are true, then do that, but only do it if this case is true. Right. So it's like uh, it's thinking along those lines that sometimes is the trickiest part. I'm a big fan of logic puzzles. Uh -huh. I was. You took computer programming a long time. I well, I also did. I was a philosophy major in college, and the math class I took in college to get the math credit was a math for non-math people yeah um because it was, same class. <laughs> it was basically numberless and i loved it it was one of my favorite classes yeah. in college yeah. and i took it as a senior so it was like i, I took this as like oh god i gotta take i gotta take a math class i gotta take this one credit so it's like okay i'll do this this thing and then i absolutely loved the class and it revolved largely around logic puzzles and I loved the ones that were five people arrive at a party, you know, their names are these things, the car colors were these things. Here are some clues. Now figure out what order they arrived in and which car each of them was driving, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. And then I finished that class and I went on with the rest of my life and the rest of my life revolved around going to graduate school, writing fiction, you know, trying to get published, all that sort of stuff. And then, you know, getting a job and didn't ever really fall back into that until about two years ago at work, they introduced a database management system that filters your work. And it is based around all those kinds of logic progressions. Everybody else in my department was like, you know, oh, how do we find information? How do we keep information clear? How do we keep it updated and consistent in our screens? Because there's just so much there. And I was the one person in the department who was like, I love this. I love doing these kinds of puzzles. Bring your <laughs> questions to me. And I would come up with the algorithms to be able to, you know, the order of what the computer should check. And yeah. I love the whole process. So even when it's frustrating, I love the whole process of like this, then that, and then result. And then the screen shows blank. And I'm like, well, that can't be right. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Having to go back in and rethink the puzzle, rethink the logic. I love that sort of thing. As a UI designer, it's like I've designed interfaces that are meant to make that kind of thinking process easy for people. Internal tools used inside of companies where it's like you're creating this wizard that's supposed to step people through this process to make it very clear and understandable in home automation the a lot of the, the approaches some of these platforms take range from wow this is like sublime 
genius to this is one of the worst interfaces. I'm so confused. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. There was a app called Stringify. It was like, if this, then that. It was a mobile app that you put on your phone where it was like, you're taking modules and you're linking them together and it's drawing lines between them. So you're like, okay, I want this thing to go off at sunset. So you grab the clock, you drop the clock on the landscape area. And then you say, and I want the light to turn on. So you put the light down and it draws a line between the clock and the light. You say the clock when it hits 5 p.m. or sunset turn this light on. It's like a very visual way to think through this, if this, then that structure. And it makes mm -hmm. it very easy to understand how everything relates. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then you go into like Habitat, which is the system I use, and you can tell it was an interface designed by an engineer. Right. <laughs> because you're using it in the, they call it rule machine. And it's literally like the most confusing layout on some of the screens, not all of them. Basic automations are really easy in Hubitat, but once you start to get a little complicated, you get lost in this weird infrastructure. And then once you create a rule, if you have to go back and edit it, good luck. It's like right. editing existing rules. It's, it's actually easier to delete a rule you screwed up on and start from scratch. That's a bad interface. There have been a lot of announcements in the past couple of weeks around the new game consoles the PlayStation yeah, yeah. 5 and the yeah. and the new Xbox. I saw somebody and they were seriously puzzled by this. They said interesting and I wonder why Xbox has announced that they will not be creating a new user interface, yeah. but PlayStation will. And my first response was that's because PlayStation's interface is awful. is abysmal. Yeah. It's so bad. And Xbox has created a hybrid between a computer, it basically is the same as Windows. Yep. So no matter which system you're on, you feel comfortable. And you're familiar with the look. You're familiar with the boxes and the black background and the, the way the text looks and where to yep. find information. They've been consistent across two different systems that you wouldn't necessarily think would be interchangeable, but they are. PlayStation, meanwhile, I shared this with you a few weeks ago. I was having errors on my PlayStation with one specific game I would try to play where every time I started the system, there was a bug in the game and the developers knew it. And you would start the game and it would fail. And it would take you to a fail screen that would say, there's been a failure. Do you want to report a problem or not? And if you click not, it would say, we highly suggest you report the problem. It would take you back to that first screen. You click report a problem. <laughs> it would then take you to another screen that would say, report the problem uh -huh. or get information. You click get information. It would say, here's the information, but there was nothing you could do but back out to go back to the screen to report the problem. Or in the corner was a button that said, ignore the problem. You could ignore the problem. And then you went back to the main menu. It was Five or six clicks, five or six clicks. They can go, do we don't have a problem. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was one of those things where instead of all of those clicks, it could have just said, you've had a problem, report the problem or ignore the problem. One button takes you out of it entirely, no matter which yes. button you pressed. Instead, yes. they made you click again and again and again to go through all these chains. And as you said, it's because somebody somewhere probably was like, oh, we don't need that other screen, so let's just send them to this other place, but we won't remove that button. It's an oversight, which creates a, a loop that you can't get out of. And right. I saw a tweet from somebody that I have a lot of respect for that said something similar, like the Xbox doesn't have a new interface for their new Xbox. I, they were like very disappointed by this. Yeah. And they were like, I would love to see the interface change in addition just to the exterior of the, the console. And I, it, my first reaction was, you want change for the sake of change. Yeah. That makes no sense. If you have an interface that actually works pretty well, why would you do like overturn the Apple cart? You do an and evolution of it. You wouldn't like start from scratch where a PlayStation, yeah. it's awful. Let's pretend this didn't happen. And, let's and change over. for the sake of change <laughs> always leads to headaches. You will upset more people by making yeah. change for the sake of change than, yeah. than you would if you just did an evolutionary change. My 14 year old son yesterday actually said, if you change something, and more people are upset with the change than we're upset with the problem, then you've done a bad job. Your son's a user interface designer. <laughs> <laughs> he is. <laughs> and the reason this came up was because we were watching something on the Xbox using YouTube and we needed to back to the beginning of the video. The video was halfway through, but we wanted to go back all the way to the beginning. And the YouTube app on Xbox no longer has a uh, jump back to the beginning button. You have to navigate your cursor 
into the, the bar, the tracking bar showing where you are in the video. And then you have to hold down the button to make it manually rewind. And then you have to hit the button while still in that bar. You have to hit the button to start the video from that point. It's that I, easy. I became so frustrated <laughs> in trying to do this that if we hadn't sat down with the intention of watching the specific video, I would have shut the app down. I got so I had to try doing this three times because instinctively, the first thing I did was click the go back button. Yeah, yeah. And what it did is it jumped back to a completely different video. So I went back to the video we were trying to watch. And then I went into the bar and I, and I rewound it thinking that I had to move back down to the play button. I moved down to the play button. It restarted from the spot we were at before. So again, oh. this is a layer. I said, I turned to my son at this point. And I said, there's no reason why they couldn't have had a button for restart video. Right. There's no reason to remove that. And I, I'm convinced that some engineer somewhere was like, oh, we've got a lot of buttons here. Why don't we remove ones that aren't useful? <laughs> Instead of somebody saying, sometimes people just want to restart the video. To bring it back to home automation, this is per that what you just described is precisely the reason why I keep describing home automation as the Wild West right yeah. now. People that want to get into it are like, well, where do I start? And it's like, well, what kind of technical expertise do you have? That has to be my first question every time. Because if you're a, if you're not technically minded at all, it's like the recommendation list shrinks to a very small number of things I can recommend. Because depending on what you want to do, you can do whatever you want. Anything is possible. But it really depends on how either much money you're willing to spend to pay somebody else to do it for you or to how willing you are to do DIY stuff and fumble your way through <laughs> some right. pretty bad interfaces. Uh, it's, it's a problem. Another way of breaking down your list would have been along those lines, which is difficulty. Yeah. Difficulty. How, where would you start in the list of items from just a ease perspective? From an ease point of view, it's like I would always recommend starting with lighting because there's some really good lighting systems that are take it out of the box, you plug it in, really good user interface for apps. Like there's some people that hate Philips Hue because they're a little more expensive, but Philips Hue is really a great user interface. It's very easy to understand. It's very easy to use, very easy to set up. As much as people don't like Amazon and Alexa for they're spying on me, it's also another really good, easy system. It's an easy system to use. Um, uh, Google Home, to a certain extent, is also easy to use. So if your Apple HomeKit products are kind of a mixed bag, but for the most part, it works pretty well. So it's like, it's these cloud services that seem to be kind of nailing the better user experience, but it's the, it's the more controlled stuff, the stuff that I gravitate towards that tends mm -hmm. to still be more difficult to do because the interfaces are designed by engineers and user experience is clearly not uh, top of mind. What was the most difficult thing? It's it's honestly it's all around the rules of the automation and for so it's me back to the, that yeah yeah it's it's the rule machine inside of Hubitat that it can do literally anything you want but there's so much frustration at times where you spend ten minutes put something together and it totally doesn't work the way you expected and then you have to go back to edit it and you end up in this weird crazy infrastructure of I have I think I just completely broke it now so I'm just right. going to destroy it and start again. Right. That for me is the biggest frustration uh, around the home automations. The devices themselves, not much of a frustration. It's like you take it out of the box, you activate it, and it's doing its thing. Like it's a temperature reader or it's a contact door sensor. Those all work. They're great. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's what you do with them that's where it gets tricky. As you were talking, the level of impact would have been another way to order these things. And yeah, yeah. so there's the question of what did you... What of these things have you put into your life that you would think is, well, it's nice to have, but it really doesn't take all that much away from what I had to do before. It's just nice to have. Those things would probably be around the lighting. It's like, even though that's the place I recommend newbies start, it's mm -hmm. also the thing where it's like, if I didn't have lights, like if my living room lights didn't automatically dim when I go into movie mode, <laughs> right? My life would not really change that much. Right. But it's it's just one of those, it's a nice convenience. Uh, but the things that I always think are the things that have the more meaningful impact are the things that actually help you save lots of energy or they make your home more secure. 
Right. Uh, so auto locking doors and, you know, better use of your HVAC system and things like that are where my attention typically goes. That leads into my next question around security. That's kind of a big hurdle for me from a having a touchpad on your front door. <laughs> I'm, it can be hacked. That's the thing yeah. you're probably thinking. Yeah, yeah, it can be hacked. It and here, here's my response the, to that though. Well, here's, before we get into that, let me let me just quickly ease of you know, Habitat to be able to do literally anything. And with that, almost maybe because of that, it is this free floating logic puzzle that you have to like, they may have created the freedom of being able to automate anything by not putting in restrictive user interface tools. You know, it's like, it's like, Oh, if we put in these things to make this easier to use, it's going to limit what people can actually do. So we'll leave it as this white board and just hand them a marker. And so that kind of accessibility ends up leading to unforeseen or possibly foreseen, but acceptable pitfalls. Oh, freedom comes with a little bit of you get lost in the wilderness. Yes. The security of a digitally run lock to me (laughs) comes with it. I mean, you mentioned like, and they've also got this nice, feature which allows you to plug this lock into basically any system that's out there yes and the moment you said that i thought that kind of willingness to shake hands comes with security flaws and i okay. that's my that's <laughs> i will now let you <laughs> walk on after okay. i haven't even said a question i've just said that i will say that i saw comments just like that Every one time, every time I do one of my home automation videos, there's somebody inevitably will say, and good luck to the teenager that hacks your home kind of a thing. Yeah. And my response to that is no, (laughs) it doesn't work that way. Uh, this stuff is heavily encrypted. Um, it's, it's okay. So how can I phrase this? A digital door lock is not inherently less secure than a keyed door lock. In fact, a digital door lock that does not have a key is more secure than a keyed door lock. The reason for that is mechanical door locks have an inherent flaw that can be broken through. All you need, if you know somebody has a slage door lock, somebody with a blank slage key can put that key in your door lock, put a, put a, a piece of wood against it, hit it with a mallet, and it knocks all of the mechanical key mechanical locks inside up allowing them to turn the key and walk inside your house. They can get inside your home in seconds without even picking your lock. It's just using brute force. The second thing is, if somebody wants to get in your home that hard, pulling out a laptop and hacking into a digital door lock is going to be so much more effort than throwing a rock through a window <laughs> or kicking down your door. I'm, it's it's not an exaggeration to say a digital door lock is dramatically more secure than a keyed door lock. And so the idea that it, where the weakness really comes in is what it's hooking into. So if you're, like my door locks are using Zigbee, which is using an encrypted form of Zigbee, which is not regular Wi-Fi. It's a wireless radio protocol, but it's not Wi-Fi. And it's connected to my Hubitat. I could theoretically have my Hubitat set up so it's not even part of my home network. So if somebody tried to break into my Wi-Fi to take over my smart home, they couldn't because my Hubitat is completely separate from my home network. It's like you can set this up in a way that is completely firewalled off from the internet. It's completely firewalled off from everything. So it's not that it's not hackable. It's the amount of effort that it would take to hack it is so huge it wouldn't be worth it. There are far easier ways to get into my house than doing that. So it's it's that's kind of where my frustration comes from. I understand where this issue comes into people's mind of everything can be hacked. If it's a computer, it can be hacked. It's like that's true to an extent, but you have to think about the amount of effort it will take to do it. And people are going to find the easiest way to get into something, and that's not it. Right. If that makes sense. That does make sense. I understand yes. what you're saying. I think that <laughs> I think that my 
my response to that is what you're not considering is that if your house is hacked, you could be sitting in your living room watching TV and suddenly all the lights go off and your dryer tells you the drying is done, but it's not. <laughs> yes. Well, that, that was the, that's the other thing is the things of mine that are internet connected that could theoretically be hacked remotely. What's the point? Right. It's like <laughs> your doorbell starts ringing. Yeah. Or my TV goes <laughs> off or my yeah. lights turn on and off. It's like, I don't understand what, what a hacker would, why would a hacker would want to do that to my house? Because they wouldn't be able to see my reaction of getting confused. <laughs> <laughs> Although they could, if they hack those cameras you've got inside your house. I've only got one that I'm testing and I will be turning that off soon because I don't like cameras inside my house for that exact reason. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, but you understand my point of the amount of effort it would take to do that just yeah. to like screw with somebody. It's like, why? Like right. nobody, the amount of effort to target a specific person would you would have a very you'd have a very specific need to target that person with the amount of work it would take to do what you're talking about so it's like it's it's not anything to worry about if if you if you set things up properly let me put it that way yeah and we mentioned the camera (laughs) yeah like people not being able to see your reaction i said you've got a camera you said you're going to be unplugging it It does raise some interesting questions about cameras in the home yeah um, which there are people who would find having a camera in their home would give them a sense of security. There have actually been some news stories about people who've been attacked in their own home and the cameras inside their home actually yes. provided valuable information about who did what. And that is, you know, some people want that and that's that's to be valued. I think the cameras, the thing that raised the biggest problem for me in the cameras in your home situation is that that demonstrates that you like to stalk around in your own home at night. <laughs> And wave to cameras. <laughs> and wave at cameras. <laughs> and that you make your wife take the trash out. Yes. <laughs> at least she was wearing a hat to protect her identity. Yeah. When she saw herself in the video, she was like scrutinizing that video of like, do I look okay? <laughs> Can you see who I am? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, you're, you're fine. You're fine, Sue. One of the things that came across as I was watching this, and it, it's probably a well duh moment for yeah. a lot of people is that home automation is really about automation. It's not about personality because there's the sci fi aspect to all this, which is yeah. we've been told that when our homes are effectively computers, almost robotic in nature, that they will have a personality. Yeah. And it really kind of struck me that, well, it's not about that. It's about creating an environment where you feel comfortable and you take off some of, there's some stress in your life, whatever it is. And effectively, it seems like what you are doing, and I mean you specifically, you, Matthew, Mm -hmm. are figuring out ways of peeling off layers of stress so you don't have to worry about certain things. You don't have to worry about the temperature of the home because that's taken care of you don't have to worry about the lights because the lights are taken care of if you leave you don't have to be overly concerned about the back door being locked because the system will be the third person in your home who's walking around making sure you've turned those things off and locked those doors exactly yep and that that's about a level of comfort it's not about having jeeves you know in the sort of um iron man vision of being able to talk to a person who's not really there as a companion or it being an autonomous thing that is cooking meals for you. It's not. Yeah. We're, we're so not there yet. It's like, I would love to have a Jarvis in my house. Um, that's where voice assistants come in, but voice assistants are so far from that right now. When voice assistants get to the point where it's like having an actual assistant, like somebody who's anticipating your needs and you can just say to them, you know, I'd really like to do X, Y, and Z, you know, tomorrow. And then they just figure it out from there and schedule and automate everything from there. We're Mm -hmm. way far, far far away from that. Right. So right now it's really just dumb automations and finding the rough edges in your life, whatever that may be, that brings peace of mind, saves you some money, whatever it is. There are things that you do day to day that you can automate so you don't have to think about them again. So it's, why not do it? So basically that's how I've approached it. And like the the auto locking the doors, it's really funny when I got these new door locks and installed them and set this stuff up within two weeks of doing that three or four times in the evening, I heard the doors 
auto lock themselves because one of us had forgot to lock the back door after bringing the dog in. Mm. <laughs> and so it was like, that's exact. Every time I'd hear, I'd be like, that's why I set that up. <laughs> right. <laughs> because somebody inevitably, <clears throat> Sue, forgets to lock the back door <laughs> when they bring the dog in. <laughs> so now we don't have to worry about that because the house, you know, five minutes after coming in, it's going to just lock the door for you. It's, it's, it's been great. It brings a level of peace of mind. With that, we've moved into the final questions I had, which I shared with you before we started recording so you could have them in the back of your head. And yeah. unless you want to take them together, I think taking them one at a time okay. makes sense. One of them being, what home automation wouldn't you set up? This one I was struggling with because it's, there's not like anything, a big like, ha ha kind of thing I wouldn't do. It's more of a smaller thing. Mm -hmm. I don't tend to do things with motion detection, auto turning things off because I don't know if you've worked in an office space that has that kind of stuff. Oh, I've had the lights at work turn off on me. Yep. That's yeah, exactly yeah. why I tend not to do this. It's like when you rely on just a motion sensor or something like that, you need to have multiple things that are trying to evaluate if somebody's there or not, not just a motion sensor. Because you set that up and you're like, this is going to be great. And you'll be sitting in your living room doing something and suddenly everything turns off. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's it yeah. was that moment that I realized, man, I'm really sedentary. Yeah. Because I, <laughs> yeah. I was in my head, I was busily at work. And apparently externally, I was... Oh. <laughs> If there was a, a time-lapse camera office, on you, you wouldn't look yeah. like you're moving at all. <laughs> yeah. From the office's perspective, they were like, well, there's nobody living here. He's certainly dead. <laughs> Turn those lights off. Play a slow dirge. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. See, if you're going to set up automation like that where the lights turn off, I think it should also be accompanied by bum, 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 bum. <laughs> Like I had set up a, a routine in the bathroom for the ceiling fan to turn itself off after a humidity hit a certain level or there hadn't been motion in the bathroom for a certain amount of time. <laughs> and inevitably you'd be in the shower and so yeah. the bathroom fan would just turn off because sure. the motion sensor wasn't detecting you in the shower because the shower curtain was blocking its view. <laughs> it was right. like, okay, this is a dumb automation. I got to change this. So the other question was what device wouldn't you use? Now, this is not a specific device. It's kind of a category of devices, and mm -hmm. it's not a hard set rule, but I tend to avoid, where I can, Wi-Fi hubless smart devices. And I say that have, as somebody who has an Ecobee smart thermostat that's Wi-Fi enabled. I do have devices that are Wi-Fi enabled, but there's a category of Wi-Fi devices you couldn't pay me to put in my house. Like, there's this Chinese company that makes a, a product called Tuya Smart Life. And it's this hubless Wi-Fi enabled cloud service that any manufacturer can tap into. So you find all over Amazon, dirt cheap smart light bulbs, outlets, you name it. They're all tapped into this Tuya Smart Life platform. Right. So you're putting in dozens of just random Wi-Fi things in your house. And for me, that makes me like, extremely uncomfortable because every one of those is a vector of attack <laughs> right <laughs> for remote control of your home because they're all little mini computers so for me i'm very cautious about when i bring a wi-fi enabled device into my house and i want to make sure i know the company i trust the company i know they're doing right. a good job staying on top of security before i put that in my house and a lot of these knockoff no-name chinese things that you find on amazon it's like literally you'll see the same exact outlet with five different names on it because there's some manufacturing company that's just pumping them out and selling them to third parties who just brand them and then resell them. And it's like, I don't think they're going to be top-notch security on those things. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, those are the things I kind of stay away from. And so it's a kind of a category of device I avoid. I know you've talked about your smartwatch and its health monitoring. Mm -hmm. it, it has... Uh, built into it, which has helped you personally and other people that we know. Um, is there yet a way for that to be linked into a home monitoring system so that your, your health could become part of a home automation system so that if somebody was 
unconscious if they had, you know, fallen or something like that, that the locks would open up when police arrived or an ambulance arrived or that family members might be notified, that sort of thing. Yeah, I say that. <laughs> tentatively because yeah. Specifically, you say that very strangely. <laughs> yeah, specifically with the Apple Watch, Apple's already included systems that do some of that. Like if mm-hmm. somebody falls down and they're clearly not responsive, the watch will notify people that you've put into your phone as the emergency contacts. Okay. And it will and it will contact like 911 automatically. So there are systems already built in, but for the systems where you can also then layer that into a broader smart home where your doors automatically unlock and all that kind of stuff, that doesn't exist yet. It feels like we're only a step away from that. It depends on if Apple opens some of that up and other watchmakers open some of those features up to Google Home smart services and Apple HomeKit right. smart services. It's like right there, right for the picking. It just is going to take somebody to yeah. create an API that allows that to happen. And it and it starts to become important for there to be a unified, acceptable way of these devices talking to each other. Yes. And you've talked about that before. Of Yes. The industry is so new and they're all kind of waddling around in their own streams and they need to find their way to the common river and actually start yep. communicating across device manufacturers so that you can have a Google Home system, but your Apple Watch can speak to it smartly so that you can have Correct. that kind of protection. Yep. We'll get there eventually. It's just going to take a little time. Whether we want to or not, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So everybody should let us know what they think. You can reach out to us on Twitter at still TBD FM. You can reach out to me at by Sean Farrell and you can reach out to Matthew at Matt Farrell and at undecided MF. Be sure to watch Matthew's most recent videos at undecided with Matt Farrell on YouTube. And you can find the podcast at still TBD.FM. Please subscribe. You can find us on all major podcast providers like iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. Please give us a rating. Give us a review and share us with your friends because it really helps the podcast. The podcast really helps the channel. The channel really helps Matthew. And then Matthew sets up home automation. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next time.